Hello, my name is Salem Stoll, and I am the current project coordinator for the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, and in this video, I will be interviewing Dr. Nicholas Crane. Dr. Crane is our current National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Stipend Competition Senior Candidate. The NEH Summer Stipend Program aims to stimulate new research in the humanities and its publications. Summer stipends support continuous full-time work on a humanities project for two consecutive months. Each year, the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, on behalf of the University of Wyoming, nominates two candidates, one junior and one senior, for this NEH competition. I'm so excited to be here with Dr. Crane today, and I look forward to hearing about his current project. So, what do you do on campus? What do you study? Yeah, so I'm a faculty member in the School of Politics, Public Affairs, and International Studies. Um, we call ourselves SPICE um, by that acronym. I'm trained in geography. Okay. I'm a political geographer by training, but I've been teaching cultural geography for longer than political geography, so I sort of think of myself as a cultural and political geographer. Okay. Um, I'm a, my title is Associate Professor of Geography and International Studies. All right, cool. Yeah. So that means you kind of know a little bit of everything, I assume, then, right? Well, yeah, you know, uh, as, I'll, as I'll, I think, probably have opportunity to mention in this interview, you know, teaching is an important part of our identity, and... Yeah, I end up teaching some disciplinary classes in cultural and political geography and a big intro class in world regional geography, so like I have to teach the world. Obviously you got nominated for the NEH stipend, so what is the project you got nominated for? Yeah, so the title of the project is Landscapes of Unaccountable Violence in Mexico and Turkey. So I'm a political geographer, as I mentioned. What that has me studying is kind of the relationship between politics broadly defined, not just like government and policy making, but also social movements and cultural politics and things like this and geographical space. So in this project, kind of territory, landscape, and place are key spatial terms for me. What I'm looking at is obviously across two contexts, right? So I'm working in both Mexico and Turkey, and also it's kind of more specific than that. I'm working in the kind of Mexico City urban region in central Mexico, and the Izmir urban region, which is, Izmir is the third largest city in Turkey, and it's kind of on the, well, it is on the Aegean coast. It's kind of furthest west in the country. And what I'm looking at in those uh, locations, I guess, are kind of landscapes, right? As the title suggests. And in particular, I'm thinking about sort of spaces of everyday life. So um, we can think about neighborhood spaces, we can think about housing developments, big infrastructure projects like waterfronts and train like railroads and, and highways and things like this. And I'm interested in, in those kinds of places for how they are configured and how they're represented. So both materially configured and also represented, that's the kind of two different versions of what landscape means okay. in the project. And how that matters, I think, is that um, power relations in those places, I want to understand, are contingent in certain ways or, or, or dependent upon um, how those places are shaped and how they're represented. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the kind of broad strokes of what I'm thinking about when I think about landscape. And then the unaccountable violence piece has to do with really state power and violence. And I'm thinking about how the shape given to these places matters in particular for economic development, which is itself, again, kind of dependent upon violence with impunity or unaccountable violence, as I have it in the, in the title. So that's the kind of broad strokes of what I'm doing, and I'll have a chance to talk about more, I'm sure. So you're saying that there is a correlation that it, violence can happen as a physical space. It, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, or in a sense, the, the kind of material assembling of, of spaces, the physical organization of spaces, but also how they're represented, right? So we can think about multiple different sources of representation, official discourse, media discourse, popular culture, that all of that ends up naturalizing, in many cases, violence, right? So ge geography or geographical space can end up mediating how a society relates to violence. What is the current scope of your project? So it yeah. sounds like it's mostly in location-wise Mexico and Turkey. It is, yeah. I mean, scope, it's kind of a broad word, isn't it? So I guess I'll look at it a couple of different ways. So the, the project I proposed is, is to write really three articles next summer. So this is the sort of summer stipend award, right? So the idea is that after a round of field work in Turkey this coming spring, I'll be writing three articles, one on Mexico based on sort of past research, past field research, past and ongoing reading, one on Turkey, so based on kind of current reading as well as some field research to come, and then finally uh, a project or a, a paper that kind of brings, them, brings the two together 
and in particular I'm interested in sort of synthesizing sources that are helpful for interpreting as I have it landscapes of unaccountable violence in both places right mm -hmm. so that's that's I guess one way of thinking about the scope another way is in terms of sort of what I'm drawing from and what I'm relating to so this project is super interdisciplinary and a lot of that owes I think to the the landscape concept right I mean like landscape I find this in my classes I end up introducing it to students and then I have to like teach them all these different fields of debate, right, and fields of practice. So everything from sort of like landscape ecology to art history and art criticism, <laughs> right, um, urban planning as well as geography, right, it's, it's a lot of different things kind of all mashed together in the sort of landscape studies field. So that's something that, that also, I guess, defines the scope of the project. And then finally, I guess we can sort of think about the issues of the day in these places, right? So Turkey and Mexico are sometimes talked about together. It's not just sort of my hobby horse, it's like actually something that, you know, um, is out there. They're, they're talked about together oftentimes by sort of economic development specialists and investors in terms of um, these being, I guess, national context countries that are emerging and that are sort of rising powers, right? The two countries are also talked about a lot together in terms of sort of authoritarianism, right? Um, so you, you often though see this in people that are studying Mexico or studying Turkey, either or, and they'll sort of focus on what they call a sort of authoritarian turn. And so in that sense too, I think the, the project sort of promises to, to bring together, I guess, these two different national contexts and sort of issues of the day. Again, by, by looking at economic development in terms of some of the sort of social costs that find expression in the shape given to places, right, or representations of places, and these landscapes of unaccountable violence. Do you want to explain a little bit more, is there any other similarities between Mexico and Turkey specifically? Yeah, sure, yeah, I mean I can talk about sort of like where the project came from, okay. I think uh, that, might, that might be helpful here. Really the project came from teaching Turkey uh, while I was doing research on Mexico, right. So I've been doing work in Mexico for more than a decade. Started kind of in 2010 with a trip and it was during a trip that wasn't about research in 2009, the year before that, that I met a current collaborator who's a sociologist in Mexico, Oliver Hernandez Lara. So I was teaching and I was trying to make sense of some work that Oliver and I had been doing together and what we've been looking at is really violence in Mexico. I mean Mexico is unfortunately in the news for violence a lot. A lot of that is attributed to the drug war but you also hear people especially in Mexico talk about generalized violence. So what that you know means really is that everyone is just to one degree or another exposed to violence or the threat of violence. At the same time, right, not everyone is exposed to the same kind of violence or to the same extent to violence, uh, right? So I mean gender-based violence and, and femicide and things like this, I mean they tend to be sort of mattering to women, right, above all. But we wanted to make sense of this kind of let's say it's like socially differentiated violence in Mexico and uh, we found as we were thinking about that that landscape was a really useful concept. Oliver lives and works in Toluca which is the state capital of Estado de Mexico just outside Mexico City to the to the west mm -hmm. and that city is constantly just like in flux and transformation and so we were thinking about, again, how these places are given shape. And this was simultaneous with like a spike in gender-based violence and femicide. Estado de Mexico is one of the worst of the states for that. And, and we were thinking about, you know, what we were seeing around us and landscape became a kind of a way of making sense of this social differentiation, the production of social vulnerability in central Mexico. In particular, we were thinking about how landscape, we talked about landscapes of disappearance, disappearance being one of the sort of what we would call a paradigmatic form of violence in Mexico because violence is often, what should we say, like unpunished in Mexico, right? Unattributed to a perpetrator, not really considered to be like worthy of investigation even. Mm -hmm. And and so we were interested in the ways that that, that, that was being produced and, and we, we thought that landscapes of disappearance is a suitable concept here and we, we sort of, it's a grounded sort of a concept, right? It kind of came up through the field work for us. We define it really as basically um, the shape given to places or representations of places that uh, facilitate disavowal of responsibility on the part of territorial authorities mm -hmm. for violence. Right? So they can say, oh, well, you know, that's just natural to that neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> for example, right? This kind of a thing. Yeah, we, we, we started to mess with that concept, think it through, and we've written a couple things in that direction. And I was writing that while I was teaching. 
And, you know, I, I mentioned in passing that I teach political geography, cultural geography, a big intro class in world regional geography, some thematic courses. In almost every class, I find that examples from Turkey are really interesting to students. And there's good reason for that. I mean, Turkey's really compelling. It's like historically really important geopolitically during the Cold War, say, right? The Ottoman Empire is only 100 years ago. I mean, next year is the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic. So, you know, thinking about sort of World War One and the sort of like how the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire matters for the making of the Middle East today, right? Turkey's increasingly sort of belligerent role in the region uh, is something that really piques people's interest. Uh, the transformation of cities, pop culture. I mean, Turkey's really famous for like TV dramas right now. So like soap operas are huge, right? And you'll find across the region especially, but also like on Netflix, if you want to go home and watch them, right? TV dramas from Turkey. So students find this stuff really interesting. And what I found is that there was, as I was like reading and teaching and also doing this research in Mexico, that there was opportunity really for putting the two, you know, areas of interest for me in conversation. And some of that came up because scholars were writing about comparisons. Um, people comparing like the Kurdish movement in Far Eastern Turkey, Iran, Iraq, like this whole kind of like, you know, stateless people situation with the Zapatistas in Southern Mexico. I mean, people have done some work to try to compare these, these places, not just in other words, economic development specialists, but also like political scientists and sociologists and people like this. So yeah, you know, I started to read and think that through. There's also, you know, another reason why I thought the two things were really interesting. Like from my first trip in Mexico, now, you know, more than a decade ago, I brought with me impressions from some of my first international experiences with my family. My, my mother is Turkish. My sister was born there. My parents lived there for a while. She was born and spent part of her first part of her life there. And, you know, so we remain interested in Turkey and I, and I couldn't help but in this unfamiliar context sort of like see the foreign through the lens of what I'd seen before in another place that wasn't the United States. Mm -hmm. So I kind of initially started to see Mexico through Turkey and now I'm sort of going the other way around, right? In an interesting way. And I just find it, you know, really compelling. Following on the word compelling, what is probably the most compelling thing you've found so far in your research on yeah. this topic? Thanks for that. Um, well, I guess one thing is really that uh, more than just these impressions that I have, there's, there's a sense that um, from doing a lot of reading these days, that there are these kind of, what would you call them, like congruent histories of Mexico and Turkey. The historical patterns are sort of similar, right? We have countries being led by uh, political leaders who were sort of announcing their intention to wrest Turkey or Mexico out from under foreign influence, right? At different moments, try to kind of like create an independent path. These are both uh, countries that have I mean, very different baggages that come from sort of previous imperial experiences, whether it's sort of the Aztecs and then the Spanish, or it's the Ottomans and then the brief occupation by the British and, right? So, you know, there's these interesting historical patterns, I think, that, that, that the two countries share. They were both countries that were sort of going through state-led development around mid-century with a lot of social spending, right, on cities especially. You saw a movement of people from rural areas into cities, and that sort of shapes the social composition of both of cities in both countries. And then in recent decades, I mean, for the past 40, 50 years, right, there's been this sort of intense neoliberalization of the countries. And, you know, by neoliberalization, I guess what we're talking about here is the sort of like the, the, the well, at least in theory, the sort of freeing of market forces in these countries. But of course, that wasn't something that is just about freeing those market forces as if deregulating is going to, you know, free those forces. In fact, those forces had to be sort of incentivized. And in both cases, they were incentivized through authoritarian measures. So there's also this way, I think, that sort of Turkey and Mexico arguably saw liberalism introduced by force, you know. And and the more I, I mean, the more I read, the more I think about this stuff, the, the more I'm convinced by that, that liberalism has always, in a sense, been haunted by authoritarianism in these contexts. But why is this work important? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why I think it's important. I guess I'll just kind of, sh like, focus on three. So, so one, I think, is, is again, these, these are countries that are oftentimes drawn into the conversation with each other for thinking about economic development and the sort of promise of growth, right? Economic growth. I think what's oftentimes left out of discourse on economic development and investment sort of discourse, right, that would categorize these as mint countries along with uh, Indonesia and Nigeria, is, is a sense that that progress or growth oftentimes comes with social costs um, and ecological costs as well, of course. 
And so looking at, at economic growth in these contexts as being somehow contingent upon a geography of violence, right, is something that I think is important about the project. Something else that I think is pretty important about the project is that uh, I'm looking at authoritarianism without being so totally obsessed with political leaders. Literature on Mexico, by literature I mean this in the broadest sense, like scholarship, also popular commentary, right? You'll see a lot of people looking at the figure of Andres Manuel López Obrador, the president of the country. And Turkey too, I mean, you know, there's a focus on the president, but in this case, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And their political coalitions, of course, but like the focus on political leadership, I think, even by avowedly kind of critical analysts, it misses something about the ways actually that the, the, the analysis itself kind of reifies or like produces, reproduces the social hierarchies that are just like obvious in these places, right? You have a political leader and sort of this top-down understanding of how power works. When in fact, like power might be a little bit more loose-ended and fragile and dispersed than all that. And so what I'm doing is, is kind of a couple things. I mean, on the one hand, I'm trying to think about the, the broader social relationships that through which power is exercised and operating. In Mexico, I mean, people are familiar with thinking about the role of criminal organizations, for example. Argentine anthropologist Rita Sagado, who writes really compellingly about what she calls the second state, the Estado Segundo, or the Segundo Estado, I guess is how she puts it. The Segundo Estado is basically like this kind of, you know, it's a way of thinking about these networks of complicity that, you know, link, I guess, people who are acting in the name of, of public institutions and people who are working outside of those public institutions. In Mexican, you know, politics, it's oftentimes attributed to criminal organizations. But in, in Turkey too, I mean, there's like a, there's a, there's a loose endedness to power. It's not just all centralized on the president, despite Erdogan's best intent, you know, best efforts. Like he's really tried to concentrate power in his presidency, but he's really dependent upon politically aligned construction firms <laughs> um, for exactly the kind of stuff that I'm thinking about in this case, the kind of construction-led uh, economic development strategy prevailing in Turkey. So that's one thing that I'm doing. And then, I'm, and then furthermore, I'm looking at landscape, right? And I'm trying to sort of think about a geographical form, which I think nicely breaks us away from just being obsessed with these uh, key figures. I mean, there are a number of other reasons why I think it's important, but I'll just, whatever. That, that, no, that's enough, right? That's plenty, that's plenty. <laughs> what reading material would you suggest for anybody who's interested in this topic, whether it be your works or other works? Yeah, cool. I mean, there's, there's so much that's really excellent. But I mean, just thinking about some stuff that's on my desk, I mentioned Rita Segato a moment ago, who writes about the Segundo, the Segundo Estado. She wrote a book called The War Against Women. It, it's in English, well, the, the, the title I've just translated. But it's in Spanish. She's, she's kind of a public intellectual. Her work is excellent, really stimulating. Um, most of it's in Spanish, but you can find translation. And I think she's super important for thinking about violence in a sort of hemispheric context, but in Mexico as well. Also on Mexico, Marcus Michael Mueller wrote a really great book called The Punitive City, kind of critical criminology, I guess. And it thinks about the sort of production of social vulnerability in Mexico City with a focus on Mexico City, I mean, like, my interest is sort of broader than that. I'm interested in the, like, the whole of Central Mexico, but he's really useful. Looking at Turkey, Zeynep Kezer wrote a really great book called Building Modern Turkey. The focus is Ankara, and it's the early republic, so it's like, kind of feels like maybe it's from ages ago. But actually, you know, it's really helpful for understanding periodizing authoritarianism. I mean, a lot of people like to talk about authoritarianism in Turkey as if it's something sort of novel and new, but I think that's really overblown. And Zeynep Kezer is talking about the built environment and cultural landscapes as embodying a kind of authoritarian state formation a hundred years ago, right? It's really interesting. And then finally, uh, there's a book that I'm reading. It's an edited collection called Turkey's New State in the Making, and it's edited by a bunch of Turkish academics. Um, but one of them will be coming to UW, actually, in March 2023. I'm trying to arrange that right now. Oh, well, that's great. So Chalar Dolek will be coming to us from Cal Poly Humboldt, and he'll be talking about his work, his kind of social history of Ankara. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that. So thank you so much for speaking to us, and I'm excited to see what work you get done this summer for this. Great. Thanks so much, Salem. And thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in seeing some of the Institute's other lectures and interviews, feel free to do so on our YouTube channel. For more information about our organization, you should join our mailing list at www.uwyo.edu slash humanities. We always appreciate it when you like, comment, or subscribe. Thank you!